Most Sundays, I'd walk the big road up to Granny Tollett's house. I always moved slowly, as befitted the scene and the season. Today, it was in the middle of June, and nature lay a vision of beauty in her vesture of flowers, leaves, and blossoming grasses as my feet shuffled down the dirt road. And if I ever tired of the road, there was plenty of short, thick grass on both sides of it, fragrant with pennyroyal and various types of herbs. I paused for just a moment and picked up a handful. There were many trees along the road, shading me from the heat of the sun and furnishing a nesting place for numerous small birds that twittered and chirped their joy in life and love of June. Occasionally, a gap in the foliage revealed the placid beauty of corn, oats, and clover stretching in a broad expanse to the distant purple mountains, with here and there a field of the cloth of gold, the fast ripening wheat that waited on the hand of the mower. As I made the turn in the road, I neared Granny Tollett's house. I could hear her voice, a high, sweet, quavering treble, like the notes of an ancient harpsichord. She was singing a hymn that suited the day and the hour. Mangling with the song, I could hear the creak of her old split-bottom chair, as she rocked gently to and fro. Both the song and the creak ceased at once when she caught sight of me, and before I'd opened the gate, she was busy placing another chair on the porch and smiling. Come on in, child, and sit down, she exclaimed, moving the rocker so I might have a good view of the bit of landscape that she knew I loved to look at. Penny Royal, child, now how did you know I loved to smell that? She crushed the bunch in her withered hands and buried her face in it, and sat there for a moment with closed eyes. Lord, Lord, she exclaimed with deep drawn breath. If I could just tell you how that makes me feel. I've been smelling pennyroyal all my life, and now, whenever I get a hold to a piece of it, sometimes it makes me feel like I was a little child again. And then again, it brings up the time when I was a girl. If I was to sit here and keep on rubbing this pennyroyal in my hands, I believe my whole life would come back to me. Honeysuckles and pinks and roses ain't any sweeter to me, child. Me and old Uncle Harvey Dean was just alike about penny roll. There were many a times I seen Uncle Harvey searching around the fence corners in the early part of May to see if the penny roll was up yet. And in penny roll time, you never saw the old man that he didn't have a bunch of it somewheres about him. Aunt Martha Dean used to say that there was dried penny roll in every pocket of his coat. And he used to put a big bunch of it on his pillar at night. On Sundays, it looked like Uncle Harvey couldn't enjoy the preaching nor the singing unless he had a sprig of it in his hand. And I recollect once just seeing him getting up during the first prayer and tiptoe out of the church and come back with a handful of penny roll that he had gathered across the road. And he'd sit and smell it and look as pleased as a child with a piece of candy. I was just sitting here resting and thinking about Miley Amos. Oh, and I reckon you heard me singing and it was fit to scare the crows as you come along. We used to call that song Miley Amos's hymn, and I could never hear it without thinking of old Miley. Why was it Miley Baker's hymn? I asked, and Granny Tollett just laughed and laughed. Law, child, don't you ever get tired of my yarns? Here it is Sunday, and you trying to get me started talking. And you know when I get started talking, there ain't any telling when I'll stop. Now come on, and let's just go look at the garden. That's more fitting for a Sunday evening than telling yarns. So together, we went into the garden and marveled happily over the growth of the tasseling corn, the extraordinary long runners on the young strawberry plants, and the size of the green tomatoes, and all the rest of the miracles that sunshine and rain had brought since my last visit. In Granny's mind, Adam and Eve were gardeners, and there was something wrong in any descendant of theirs who didn't love a garden. To Granny, they were lacking in primal instinct, but she was in this respect a true daughter of Eve a faithful co-worker with the sunshine, the winds, and the rain, and all the other forces of nature. What do you reckon folks will do if it wasn't for planting time and growing time and harvesting time? I've heard folks say that they were just tired of living, but as long as there was a garden to be planted and looked after, there was something to live for. And I tell you, unless there's gardens in heaven, I'm pretty certain I ain't gonna be satisfied there. But the charms of the garden couldn't divert me from the main theme. And once we were seated again on the front porch, I returned the conversation to Miley Amos and her hymn. You know, Granny, I said, there isn't any more harm in talking about a thing on Sunday than there is in just thinking about it. And Granny yielded to the force of my logic. Well, I reckon you've heard me tell many times about our choir, she began. 
smoothing out her silk apron with her fingers that evidently felt the need of knitting or some other form of familiar work. John Petty was the bass, Sam Crawford was the tenor, and Jane was the alto, and Miley Amos sung soprano. I reckon Miley might have been called the leader of the choir. She was the sort of woman that generally leads in whatever she happens to be doing, and she had the strongest, finest voice in the whole congregation. All the parts appeared to depend on her, and it seemed like her voice could just carry the rest of the voices, along like one big river that takes up all the little rivers and carries them down to the ocean. I used to think about the difference between her voice and Miss Penelope's. Miley's was just as clear and true and four times as strong, but me, I'd rather hear one note of Miss Penelope's than a whole song of Miley's. Miley's was just a voice, and Miss Penelope's was a voice and something else besides. And just what that something was, I never could say. Miley was the very one for the choir, and she kind of kept them all together and led them along. And we was mighty proud of our choir back in those days. We'd always have a voluntary after we got our new organ, and I used to look forward to Sunday on account of that voluntary. It used to sound so pretty to hear them begin the singing when everything was still and solemn. And I can never forget the hymns that they sung then. Sam and Miley and John and my Jane. But there was one Sunday when Miley didn't sing. Her and Sam came in late, and I knew the minute I set eyes on Miley that something was the matter. Generally, she was smiling and bowing to people all around. But this time, she walked in and set the children down and then set herself down without even looking at nobody to say nothing of smiling or speaking. Well, anyways, when half past ten come, they started the music, and all of them began singing except Miley. She sat there with her mouth tight shut, and she let the bass and the tenor and the alto have their own way. I thought maybe she was just out of breath for coming in late and in a hurry. And I looked for her to join in, but she just sat there, looking straight ahead of her. And when Sam passed her the hymn book, she took hold of it and shut it up and let it drop in her lap. And there was just the tenor and the bass and the alto doing their best. And everybody laughing or trying to keep from laughing. <laughs> I reckon if old Uncle Jim Matthews had been there, he'd have took Miley's place and helped him out. But Uncle Jim had been in his grave for more than two years. Sam looked like he was about to go through the floor. He was just mortified. And he kept looking around at Miley. And he finally said, Well, why don't you sing? Please sing, Miley. But Miley never opened her mouth. I'd about concluded that Miley must have a sore throat or something like that. But when the first hymn was give out, Miley joined in and sung as loud as anybody. And when the doxology came around, Miley was on hand again. And everybody was sitting there wondering why on earth Miley hadn't sung the voluntary. When church was out, I heard Sam inviting Brother Hendricks to go home with him and take dinner with him and they all drove off together before I'd had time to speak to Miley. Well, anyways, later that week, when our women's group met, Miley was there bright and early, and when we'd all got fairly started with our sewing, and everybody was in good humor, Sally Ann said, Miley, I want to know why you didn't sing that voluntary Sunday, and I reckon everybody here wants to know, but nobody but me's got the courage to ask. And Miley's face got just as red as a beet, and she burst out a laughing and said, Oh, I do declare. I'm ashamed to tell you all. I reckon Satan himself must have been there and me last Sunday. You know, there's just some days when everything goes wrong with a woman. And last Sunday was one of them days. I got up early and dressed the children and fed my chickens. And I strained the milk and washed up the milk things. And I got breakfast and I washed the dishes and cleaned the house. And then I went and gathered the vegetables for dinner and washed the children's hands and faces and put their Sunday clothes on. And just as I was starting to get myself ready for church, I happened to think I hadn't skimmed the milk for the next day's churning. So I went down to the spring house and I did the skimming. And just as I picked up the cream jar to set it on that shelf that Sam had built me, my foot slipped and down I came and I skinned my elbow on the rock step and I broke that jar all to pieces and spilled the cream all over creation. And there I was, four pounds of butter and a 50 cent jar gone and my spring house in such a mess that I still ain't done cleaning it yet. And my right arm was just as stiff as a poker ever since. Oh, I tell you, we all had to laugh the way Miley told it. And then Sally Ann said, Well, that was enough to make a saint mad. Oh, it sure was, Miley said. And you all know that I'm far from being a saint. However, when I picked up the pieces and washed up the worst of the cream, I finally went inside the house to get myself ready for church. And before I could get there, 
I heard Sam hollering for me to come and sew a button on his shirt. One of them had come off while he was trying to button it. So I went out and got my work basket, and the children had been playing in it, and there wasn't a needle to be found, and my thimble was gone. And then I had to hunt up the apron that I was making for little Sam and get the needle off that. And just then, I ran that needle into my finger. And not having any thimble, I got a good blood spot. I got a good blood spot on the shirt. Then, before I could get my dress over my head, here come little Sam with his clothes all dirty, where he had fell in the mud. And then I had to dress him again. And that made me matter still. And then, I finally got out to the wagon. I rubbed my clean dress against the wheel. And that made me mad all over again. And the nearer we got to church, the madder I was. And now, do you reckon all I'd been through that morning and still had dinner ahead of me to get and the children to look after all that evening? Do you reckon that I felt like sitting up there and singing, Welcome, sweet day of rest. I ain't seen a day of rest since I married Sam. And I don't expect to see any until I die. And if Parson Page wants that hymn sung, let him get a choir of old maids and old bachelors. For they're the only people I've ever seen rest on Sunday or any other day. We all laughed and we didn't blame Miley one bit for not singing that hymn. And then Miley said, I reckon I might as well tell you the rest of the story. By the time church was over, I had kind of cooled off. But then I heard Sam asking Brother Hendricks to go home and have dinner with us. And that made me mad all over again. For one thing, I knew that that meant a big dinner for me to cook. And I had made up my mind then that I wasn't going to cook a blessed thing, company or no company. Sam had killed the chickens the night before. And they was all dressed and ready down in the spring house. And all the vegetables were right there on the back porch. But I never touched them. I just happened to have some old cold ham and some cold mutton on hand. And not much of either one. And I sliced them up and I put the ham on one end and the big meat dish and the mutton in the other with a big bare place in between so as everybody could see that there wasn't enough of either one of them to go around. And then I sliced up a loaf of my salt rising bread. And I got out a bowl of honey and a dish of preserves. And then I went out on the porch and I told Sam that dinner was ready. I never shall forget the way we all laughed when Miley was telling it. You know how quick a man gets up when you tell him dinner's ready. Well, Sam had jumped up and he said, Why, Miley, you're mighty smart today. I don't believe there's another woman in the county that could get a Sunday dinner this quick. Come on, Brother Hendricks, let's eat. Miley used to say that Sam's face changed quicker than a flash of lightning when he saw the table. And he dropped down in his chair and forgot to ask Brother Hendricks to say the grace. Why, Miley, where's the dinner? Where's them chickens I killed last night? And where's the potato and the corn and the butter beans? And Miley just looked him square in the face and said, Them chickens are out in the spring house and the vegetables are on the back porch. Do you suppose I'm going to cook a hot dinner for you and on this sweet day of rest? <laughs> now that wasn't a polite way for nobody to talk at their own table. And then some of us asked Miley, well, what did Brother Hendricks say? And Miley's face got just as red as a beet again and said, Why, he behaved so nice, and he just made me feel right ashamed of myself for acting so mean. He just reached over and helped himself to everything he could reach, and he said, Well, this dinner may not suit you, Brother Amos, but it's plenty good for me. And just the kind I'm used to at home. I'd rather eat a cold dinner any time than to have my woman tolling over a hot stove for me. And when he said that, Miley got up and told him why she didn't feel like getting a hot dinner and why she didn't sing the voluntary. And when she'd got through, he said, Well, sister, if I'd have been through all you've been through this morning, and then I had to get up and give out such a hymn as Welcome, Sweet Day of Rest, I believe I'd have been mad enough to pitch the hymn book and the Bible at the deacons and the elders. Just then, he turned around to Sam and said, Brother Amos, have you ever thought about it? That there ain't a pleasure in the world that a man enjoys that a woman didn't have to suffer for it. And Miley said that made her feel even meaner than ever. And when supper time came, she lit the fire and got the best hot supper that she could. Fried chicken and waffles and hot soda biscuits and coffee and goodness knows what else. Now wasn't that just like a woman to give in after she had gotten her own way for a little while but couldn't have kept from having it? Your Papa Coy used to say that women and runaway horses was just alike. The best way to manage both of them was to give them the rein and let them go until they got tired. And they'll always stop before they do any mischief. Miley said that that supper tickled Sam pretty near to death. And you know, Sam was always mighty proud of Miley's cooking. So that's how we came to call that hymn, Miley Amos' Hymn. And as long as Miley lived, 
folks would just look at her and laugh whenever the preacher said, Brethren, let's sing Welcome, Sweet Day of Rest. The story was over, and Granny Tollett folded her hands, and we both surrendered ourselves to a happy silence. All the faint, sweet sounds that break the stillness of a Sunday in the country came to our ears in a gentle symphony. The lisp of the leaves, the chirp of the young chickens lost in the mazes of billowy grass, and the rustle of the silver poplar that turned into a mass of molten silver whenever the breeze touched it. Whenever you've lived as long as I have, child, Granny Tollett said, you'll feel that you've lived in two worlds. A short life don't see many changes, but in 80 years, you can see many things passing away and new things coming in to take their place. And when I look back at the way Sunday used to be and the way it is now, it's just like being in another world. I hear folks a-talking about how wicked the world's growing and wishing they could go back to old times. But I tell you, it looks like to me there's just as much kindness and goodness in folks nowadays as there was when I was young. Kindness, J.D. Always be kind. And remember that folks is going through something that you can't see. Mm-hmm.